see your face. Yeah, I, um, it is apparently impossible to share my screen and have the camera on at the same time. Okay, I mean. On an iPad, so. So, um, so shall we start or do you need them more, uh, one more minute? Or? Let, let's start. Let's start. Okay, okay, so very good. Uh, let me start the recording. Recording in progress. Okay, very good. So now we will have the second lecture of Kevin Costello on uh, twisted holography. Please. Okay, I'm uh, so sorry for those technical difficulties. Um, I don't know what Zoom is up to today. So. So last time we discussed how, let me zoom out a little bit, let me see a little more, no, that's not possible. Last time we discussed how an n equals two SCFT will give rise to a 2D chiral algebra. And we saw that the conformal anomaly becomes the BRST anomaly. So, the first thing I want to do today is work through some examples where we can see explicitly that the BRST anomaly vanishes. So the basic example is n equals four super young moles. Uh, of course, as I think everybody knows, this is a super conformal field theory. So in this case, uh, well, this is n equals two with the hypermultiplet and the adjoint representation of u n. Now, when we twist, um, the hypermultiplet becomes two fields, not one field. So each hypermultiplet becomes a pair of some vector bosons. So this tells us that in the chiral algebra, we're going to find a pair of adjoint value fields, x1 and x2. So x1 and x2 are both matrices. So if we write them in components, as I've done in the middle of the slide, find x1 ij, x2 kl, and the OPE takes this form. It's like the trace of the product of those two matrices. The BC ghosts are also matrices. And their OPE takes the same form. So if we look at, we think how things arise from the physical theory N equals four super young mills has six adjoint valued scalar fields in terms of string theory, these six fields describe the motion of a d three brain in ten dimensions and x one and x two are two of these six scalars or there there's some there are certain complex linear combinations of them. So in this theory, the BRST charge from what we saw last time is just given by trace BC, trace BCC plus trace CXX with some epsilon tensors when we contract the X's. So this is just a special case of our discussion from last time. And we can ask, why does the BRST anomaly vanish? The reason is, well, we saw last time, the BRST anomaly vanishes if the trace in the matter representation of a product of two matrices is twice the trace in the adjoint representation. Now, in this case, since the matter representation is 
two copies of the adjoint representation, that just holds automatically. So let's look at another example. This is an n equals two theory studied by Cyborg and Witten in their famous work in the 90s. In this case, the gauge group is SU2, and there's four fundamental hypermultiplets. As we saw, each, each hypermultiplet is two fields. So each fundamental hypermultiplet will give four fields. And since there's four fundamental hypermultiplets, we'll get 16 matter fields in the Cairo algebra. Since these transform <clears throat> in eight copies of the fundamental, we can write the matter fields as I or alpha, or or ones from one to eight, and alpha is an index for the fundamental representation of SU2. So in this case, the OPE is I or alpha, I S beta, is delta or S, epsilon alpha beta times one over Z, as we see. So if we think about the symmetry of this, the OPE only involves um, the tensor delta or S in the S indices. So therefore it's invariant under the group SO8. So, at first, one might have thought that a theory, an n equals two theory with four flavors would have U4 flavor symmetry, but actually it's enhanced to this larger group. Now the gauge fields of B and C are of course adjoint valued. And the BRST charge takes this form. Okay, so we can ask, well, maybe you need to pause one second. Are there, are there any questions? No. Okay, so, so we can ask in this example, you know, we know because the literature tells us that this should be uh, a superconformal theory, we can ask, can we check that there is no BRST anomaly? So the way to check this, well, let's think of the BRST anomaly as a relation that says for a matrix in SL2, which I'm calling A, we want trace of A squared in the matter representation is twice trace of A squared in the adjoint. So let's compute this. Our matrix A is trace free, so let's diagonalize it with eigenvalues lambda and minus lambda. Now in the fundamental representation, of course, A has eigenvalues lambda and minus lambda by definition. So the trace of A squared in the fundamental is two lambda. Since we have eight fundamentals, the trace is, sorry, it's two lambda squared. Since we have eight fundamentals, the trace is 16 lambda squared. Let's compare this to the adjoint. One minute. The, the adjoint representation, we can take this basis 
H, E, and F, given by these matrices, or H is diagonal and E and F are upper and lower triangular. And the commutation relations tell us that the eigenvalues of A in this basis are two, minus two, and zero. Therefore, trace of A squared is eight lambda squared. And therefore, trace in the matter is twice trace in the adjoint. Okay, so that was a little elementary computation of the absence of the BRST anomaly in that case. So more generally, so we're gonna be interested in holographic statements. So to have a holographic statement, we need to have an infinite sequence of n equals two SCFTs with a gauge group whose rank increases. So we've already seen this in the n equals four case, but this also happens for these examples with SO8 flavor symmetry. Sorry, one second, I'm gonna to try to log in on the other device too. I'm sorry for the mess with Zoom. Um, Bobby, could you allow me to share a screen on the other device and then, then I can write on this and this be better. I'll stop sharing this. I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, no problem. We'll try to give you host privileges. Let's see. Stop share. Okay, it seems it's working. Okay, I'm so sorry. Nice. So now we can sorry. see also your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, let's find this part of your right. Okay. Good. So because we're interested in, in a lot of people, <clears throat> we, we would like to have an infinite sequence of such um, <clears throat> n equals two SCFTs. So it turns out that there is such a sequence. With SO8 flavor symmetry. I think there's a big lag, but I'll try to move my slides my slide slowly. Okay. So in these cases, the gauge group is SP. Now for n equals one, SP2n is SE2, so this does indeed generalize. The matter content consists of a vector i, which is in C8, tensor C to the 2n. So really i should be thought of as eight vectors. And then there's two matrices. <clears throat> OK. 
Can can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can see you and hear you. Okay. Uh, so the matter point in these examples is uh, eight vectors and two matrices with certain symmetry properties. I don't want to go into too much detail on every little thing about this example. It will be important for us. The OBEs are, there's a non-zero OBE of the vector with itself and of the matrices with itself. So I, I goes like one over Z and X, one, X, two goes like one over Z. And just like in the SCT case, of course we need to introduce the BC ghosts. So because we're in the group SP in this case, B and C are symmetric matrices. So let's, if we write things a little more succinctly, let's write omega here for this 2n by 2n matrix. And the symmetry properties of B and C is expressed here. B transpose omega plus omega B equals zero and similarly for C. And X1 and X2 satisfy a similar condition. So in sum, the field content of this model consists of B and C matrices with some symmetry properties, X1 and X2 matrices with other symmetry properties and eight vectors. I won't give the details of why this model is also anomaly free. It's a little exercise in algebra to check that twice the trace in the adjoint is equal to the trace in the matter. So our goal is to study these 2D chiral systems, which are pieces of the n equals two theories at a large end. So when we see systems at large n, all we need to do is understand the single trace operators. Because in any holographic system, single trace operators correspond to states of the dual gravitational theory. So let's, it turns out you can count It turns out you can calculate the single trace operators exactly. Um, so let me describe the answer, but maybe I should quickly pause for questions first. No questions? So I think everything we're doing so far today is really quite elementary. So the first thing to check is that this operator, trace of x1 to the k, is B or ST closed. How do we do this? Let's, here we're considering the case of n equals four, where we have x1 and x2 adjoint value fields. The BRST current is trace BCC plus this one, which is trace x1, x2 minus x2, x1, all multiplied by C. So what we're asking, is this BRST closed? What we need to do is place my operator, the point, and integrate the BRST current around it. 
that contour integral will pick up any first order poles in the OBE between the BRST current and my operator. Now, if we look at the diagrammatics, the operator has only x1s, and the BRST current has x, you know, it has exactly one x2. Since x1 and x2 pair with each other when we do a wick contraction, we can think of them in the same diagram notation. The propagator here connects x1 and x2. There's only one wick contraction possible. So this is computing that this is BRST closed is a tree level computation. And since there's two terms in the BRST current involving x, these two terms here, we'll pick up two terms in the OB. And if you calculate it, the, the two terms are the same, but the play appear with a different sign. So we find that indeed trace of x1 to the k is a BRST closed operator. Now from this, we can bootstrap this argument to build many more of BRST closed single trace operators. To do this, we note that x1 and x2 form a doublet under an action of SU2. This is an action which comes from or symmetry in n equals four super young mills. In n equals four, there's an SO6 or symmetry which rotates the six scalars. Here, only two of the scalars survive, but they're rotated by an SU2. Since it's a symmetry, if I take Okay. Any state, if I take a trace of x1 to the k and apply an SU2 generator, that will still be BRST closed. The things you find if you do this are the symmetrized traces, where I take some OR powers of x1, S powers of x2, and I symmetrize in the order. That is, I sum over all permutations of how to order x1 and x2 inside of the trace. Okay, so this is an elementary discussion of how to build BRST closed single trace operators at large n. If you work a little bit harder, you can compute the entire BRST cohomology at large n. And you find the following description. There's four towers of states. One tower is the one we just described, the symmetrized trace of x1 to the or x2 to the x. And that's bosonic, a spin or possessor for two. And there's two fermionic towers, which look very similar, where I insert the B ghost or the derivative of the C ghost. And finally, there's an, another bosonic tower, which is a little more complicated. And I haven't written out the full expression here. It involves del x and x, and then a symmetrized trace. So the result is, in this n equals four case, this is a complete description of all of the operators. And really of the spectrum, since we know their dimensions. So all operators are obtained by taking one of the elements of these four towers, differentiating them some number of times, and taking their normally ordered products. So our task is going to be to find a string theory which will have the same spectrum. So let's move on to the next case. The other example of a family of chiral algebras depending on n 
which we li would like to model holographically, is the one with SO8 flavor symmetry. This was a little more complicated, but if you remember, the fields of this model consisted of eight factors, I, Every five minutes or so, I appear to be getting kicked out of Zoom. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, we lost uh, 20, on? 20 seconds or something like that. Is the audio okay? Now it's uh, good. Okay. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Hmm. Well, yeah, I'm so sorry for all these troubles. Um, sure, no problem, but now we can hear you, so you can, you can go on. Okay, so in this case, and the other example with the SO8 flavor symmetry, the, if you recall, there is eight factors, two matrices, as well as the B and C coasts. So in this case, one has other open strings you can build, which look like I'll draw a picture. This means I, I, in the middle of a bunch of X's. So it's a vector matrix. Take your vector, then you hit it with a bunch of matrices, and then you end with a vector again. So the large N single, you know, sorry, these. The terminology is usually that um, expressions like this are also called single traits or single string, really. Um, so in this case, we can also enumerate all of the states and we find these extra open string states together with the bosonic states that we saw in the n equals four case. The fermionic states of the n equals four case turn out not to contribute because of some symmetry using the matrices. So in this case, all the operators are bosonic. And if you look at the lowest order or one, TRS zero, zero, this is just the SOA current. The current holograph for the SOA flavor symmetry. Whereas these other ones, that's some kind of infinite dimensional SOA extension of these SOA current algebras. So, as you said, our goal is going to be to find a string theory or a gravitational theory, which is holographically dual to these models. I have a question. So that is, we wanted. Yeah. Yes. So for um, yeah. for the case of n equal four superior meals, uh, we know that there is a dual is a string theory on ADS five cross S five. Mm -hmm. So for the other class of example, uh, SP two n with these eight flavors, um, do, do we know of a standard uh, holographic pair before the twisting? I think so. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I mean, there's a string theory embedding of this system as a D3 ring lying on a D7, 47s, and an O7 minus plane. So I, I, would, I would guess that you, it's just going to be ADS5 times S5, or you've also inserted certain seven rings into the geometry. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, so in the, in the just, twisted setup, what we're going to find is that the topological stream will capture the holographic jewel, or will capture these chiral algebras at large. And what I'm hoping to do is, you know, there's some really fun computations you can do with these chiral algebras, from which you can see the aspects of the geometry emerging. The origin of this is in a conjectural relationship between the physical and topological strings. So if you remember, we got these chiral algebras by thinking about placing a D3 brain on a cigar in some supersymmetric setting where the cigar was you know, forced to rotate, or the Q squared was rotation. The idea is that we should do the same thing for type 2B supergraphic. And we have a product of two cigars, times C3. And the conjecture is that after an appropriate twisting, this becomes a topological B model in C3. So this is not a new conjecture, or at least not completely new, because it's these kinds of connections between physical and topological strings go back to the early days of topological strings in the 90s. So it's discussed in the famous paper of Bershatsky, Sigarhi, and Gurian Vata, where they talk about the, the gravity photon background. Can you... I think we lost you. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, but we cannot see your screen. Yeah, I... Yeah, it I, appears I, that your I screen is frozen. Out of the other one, I'll stick to this one. I mean, maybe using the, the PDF was uh, bad. Using your, uh, your tablet is, is too complicated. This is what a disaster. I don't know what's going on today. Okay, can I... So conjectures relating the B model on C3 to type 2B spring have been made since the early days of spring theory. We cannot, uh, we and can still, we cannot see. Yeah, I, I think there's nothing I can, I think maybe we'll just have to go without seeing. Is that okay? Uh, can you see my screen, my slides? No, we cannot see. Anything? Uh, let, let's see. Have I done? Yes, now we can. Yes. Okay. Really wish I knew what the problem was. Anyway, so these kinds of con conjectures have been made since the early days of string theory, but you know, things were really exciting back then, and I think people didn't want to take the time to stop and really derive everything from first principles. So I would say the first principles proof of these relationships is still lacking, but there's really nice work by Severian Williams and Eger and Hanner, where they study, they take the super gravity multiplet and take its Q cohomology and they identify that with the fields of topological string theory. So I think there's really solid evidence that these relationships hold. And I'm going to accept that it should work for the rest of these lectures. So our approach is 
But if type 2B on the product of these two cigars with the D3 brain wrapping one cigar times a plane. This is going to become the topological string on flat space, but now with a brain in the topological string, call it a D1 brain, wrapping a copy of C inside of C3. The theory on the D1 brain will be the chiral algebra that we've been discussing when it was born. When we back react the D1 brain from the topological string, we'll find we'll get a new geometry, which is the six manifold SLTC, which you can think of as ADS3 times S3. And the statement of twisted holography is that the topological string on SLTC is equal to, equivalent to the large N chiral algebra. The connection with ordinary holography is a conjecture, which is kind of, I think I'd reach at the moment, that the topological string arises as a twist of type 2B supergravity on ADS5 times S. So I'd like to move on to discuss what is the top of the string. But um, before I do that, are there any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, one can think of SL2C as ADS3 times S3, but one can also think of it as the cotangent bundle of the three sphere, and that has a well behaved Calabi-Al metric. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if, if it's helpful to think of it that way. Well, the metric, like the Kähler structure is not going to play any role in our analysis. Mm. So it's only as a complex manifold we're going to see it. So I don't think one can really see the distinction between them. Okay. Answers my question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so what is the topological string? So let's. So the most important field the topological string is the Boltrami differential. which is a tensor that looks like this. And it is constrained. Maybe this is not gonna be super important for us. Constraint to satisfy an equation, which really just says that it's divergence free. But the geometric meaning of this the Beltrami differential um, plays a geometric role very similar to the graviton in an ordinary gravitational theory. So if we have a manifold that has SU3 all on it. And 
which implies it is really flat. And so satisfies the vacuum Einstein equation. Then the data of the metric uh, parameterized by two pieces of data. Omega I J bar, scalar form. and mu k bar i, Beltrami differential. This varies the complex structure. So from this perspective, the Beltrami differential is like literally some of the components of the metric. So the conjectural picture the omega i j bar components vanish when we twist. That is, they, they are Q exact, or Q is the supercharge. In other words, the topological string captures a piece of some version of Einstein gravity, or we've discarded the Kähler form, but retained the Beltrami correction. So the equations of motion of the topological string are that Beltrami differential finds an integral information of the complex structure. So which means, in order to write the equation, that may not the usual DB, DZ bar, D bar up, which looks like this, plus U I J bar, DZ bar J, This whole thing squares to zero. So in addition, to the gravitational field, We have some other fields. And well, we had two classes of model of viral algebra, one with S and weight favor symmetry, and one which is just n equals four. So there's the type two, the ordinary topological string. In this case, the other fields are a pair of fermionic fields Lagrangian.
for these fields is this very simple expression. Where we've covariantly coupled the Beltrami differential. So for the type one topological string, which is dual to the equals two theory with S away flavor symmetry. In the bulk geometry, we also have an SOA gauge field. With the holomorphic in time group again. Looks like this. So, in this case, the equations of motion for A, B, F define a holomorphic. So eight bundle on the space time. Okay, so now we have these two models, each of which has a field which is a Beltrami differential, together with some other fields, fermionic in the case of type two. And bosonic in the case of type one. And then we're going to be able to match these theories on SL2C with the chiral algebra. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is there some constraint on the on this SO8 bundle that it has to be SO8 or any bundle would give a, a good uh, topological string, type one topological string? Yeah. It has, uh, as well, as far as I know, it has to be SO8. There are suggestions from S3, you know, if you, well, this is a bit more complicated, if one tries to build the holographic jewels of certain non-Lagrangian N equals two theories, they will have flavor symmetry, which might be E6 or something like that. So there's a possibility there's an exotic topological string in the E6. But for this kind of fairly simple things we're discussing, the constraint comes from If we were studying uh, the ordinary type two, type one string, you find that SO32 comes by thinking about the hexagon anomaly. In this dimension, there's a box anomaly. So, this diagram fails to be gauge invariant. This is a diagram in the gauge theory. Gauge variation
bivariate on A goes to A plus D bar C, this diagram varies like this. So this is an expression that descends from an eighth form, as you would expect for an, an anomaly in six dimensions. And the eighth form is traced after the fourth. Um, but this is canceled. By a mean fourth mechanism, which involves an exchange of closed string fields. That's new. And this requires that trace in the adjoint of x to the fourth is traced in the frontal mantle of x squared squared. Or the proportional to. So, just like in the familiar case in 10 dimensions, there are certain trace identities and also a constraint on the dimension, which force you to, uh, which tightly constrain the, the group. Uh, okay. Thanks. Let's see. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the back reaction. Uh, let me. I think I should postpone that till next time. About how, how we back react to a, a D1 brain to get us to SLTC. Maybe I can stop now when we can have, have questions. I mean, if you want, since uh, you you lost a lot of time, you can uh, take. Um, I mean, you you still have three minutes, but you can take five or or. or okay. Or... If we play the one brain on C inside of C3, I got to take my coordinates C1, Z2, Z3, brain W2, Z, W1, W2 on the brain is in the loop of W, Y, 0. And this sources I'm not going to derive the equation for the field it sources. I'll just write the equation down. The equation is that the Z component of mu to be delta function. Uh, w1, w2, zero. So what we'll find is if we solve this equation, with an end there, move the three with the brain removed to SLTC. So let's try to solve the equation. This is a pretty standard PDE. 
Well, the solution is given by the Bachmann Martinelli curl. Where the z component of mu is equal to n. And then there's some kind of factors of 4 pi or something like that. Times. So it's kind of an amusing exercise to try to solve, to try to check that this Bachmann Martinelli kernel indeed satisfies that equation. So, how does this deform the geometry? Well, it deforms the geometry by changing the Cauchy Woolman equation. I'm going to have f, which is a function of all of the variables. And the equation is going to be d bar plus mu z d by dz of f is equal to zero. Now, if we collect the components, the F, the W bar one minus N over W to the four and um, it's coming from up here. W bar two, the F, the Z equals zero. And the last equation is that the F. Z bar to zero. So what we will do tomorrow is solve this equation, and we'll find that the solution to this equation give you coordinates on the manifold SLTC. Okay, so I, I think that's the reasonable point to stop. Okay, very good. Thank you.